Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Cabral Concept. Hopefully, this will be a fun one for you here today and really epitomizes the way that I look at nutritional science and science in general. A lot of people, they start where their mindset is already at. So they already believe what they believe, and then they look for studies in order to back up what they believe, right? I mean, that's literally what so many people do. But I don't think that that's in the best interest of all of us, like as a greater health-based community. So what I want to share with you is really the truth about coffee. New studies are coming out all the time, oftentimes big meta-analysis looking at all sorts of different studies. And I think you'll find this really fascinating. So kind of titling this show, The Truth About Coffee, Miracle Brew, or unhealthy health risk, right? So let's look at this. So a lot of people love coffee. They really do. Now, you could, you could substitute black tea if you wanted to. But here's the issue. Oftentimes, you get one side saying you should never have any caffeine because it fires up the nervous system, produces greater amounts of norepinephrine and cortisol, excitatory neurotransmitters, and it can kind of burn out your adrenals and the nervous system. Okay, that's one side. The other side is quoting all the polyphenols and the improvement in glucose. Like We'll, we'll talk about those as well. So it's fascinating because you have two people directly quoting different studies and saying that all people then should follow just their side. I don't know. Is that correct? Let's dive right in. So the first one is this. I want to go over the benefits of coffee, but if you want to insert black tea, you can absolutely insert black tea as well because they're going to be nearly one and the same. So this one came out of BMC Medicine. I'm going to give you all of the different studies, and I will link them up today at stephencabal.com slash 34 one four, just in case you want to dive deeper if you're in the health-based industry or you just love the science, great. I'm going to link all of that up, which I love to do, of course. All right, so the first one is coffee consumption, even decaf, has been linked now over and over to lower risk of death across almost all cause mortality, but at least dozens of health-based, mortality-based issues like the high cholesterol, the elevated heart disease-based issues, uh, blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and we'll be talking about those. So pretty fascinating. Another study in nature said three to four cups a day. Like That's a lot of coffee too. If you add that up, just say the average cup is about 150 milligrams. So now you're at about 300 milligrams uh, for two. And then if you double that, which is two, by the way, um, 300 milligrams is typically recommended as, like generally regarded as safe. So you don't really want to go above 300 milligrams. Now, when you look at a lot of these energy drinks, sometimes they can be three, 400 uh, grams of caffeine, milligrams of caffeine per energy drink, and people are drinking multiple per day. But this study is saying at least with coffee, right, it's actually a reduction in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Why that's important is that the number one cause of death is still cardiovascular disease. And this is saying that up to three to four cups which again, this, they're talking about caffeinated coffee for the most part, unless they don't state that specifically, then you're looking at sometimes 600 milligrams of caffeine. But again, it's from coffee, and I state that not from energy drinks, because you're getting a massive amount of polyphenols and chlorogenic acid, which I'll talk about in a second. You don't get those necessarily from energy drinks, almost any, unless they have literally natural-based polyphenols in there uh, that come from fruits and veggies and coffee beans. All right, so then that was on coffee and longevity. The next section's on the brain and liver health, two things that I think we're, it's really important, right? If we want to live a long time, well, we want a healthy liver because that detoxes our body, literally removes all these microplastics and chemicals from the environment, and then our brain, uh, which we need to keep us sharp. Okay, so this one was in the European Heart Journal, and it showed that moderate coffee intake may reduce and typically does reduce stroke and dementia. Moderate coffee consumption, about one to three cups per day. All right, additional studies showed that uh, there was an improvement in liver enzymes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which I did on another show that anywhere from one in five to one in eight adults get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, inflammation of the liver, not from alcohol. So pretty impressive. And it said it even reduces cirrhosis risk of the liver. So the worst thing that you can really happen or happen to the liver is cirrhosis where the, essentially the liver is dying. It's breaking down. It's completely inflamed. All right, this has always been a fascinating one, and the studies continue to prove it out. Type 2 diabetes and metabolism. A meta-analysis published in PubMed shows a consistent inverse relationship between coffee and type 2 diabetes risk. So that means that the more coffee you drink, for whatever reason, the lower the risk of type 2 diabetes. 
Now, it goes on to say that this could be a result of chlorogenic acid, but I also believe it is because coffee and its polyphenols, things that you're not necessarily going to get on an all meat diet that people are promoting, all of these polyphenols help to, and bioflavonoids help to lower inflammation. And when you look at all of the top causes of death, we'll name them again. I, I think it's important to remember them: cardiovascular, blood pressure, stroke, type two diabetes, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and cancer. Okay, all of those are massively inflammatory in root cause. Now, inflammation always has a root cause itself, but if you can start to reduce inflammation, there's less likelihood that you'll die from any one of those five. And coffee just so happens as a plant food, high polyphenols, bioflavonoids, high in chlorogenic acid starts to reduce that. So pretty fantastic uh, studies there. Now, I want to go over some of the controversy. So we've got the benefits on one side, controversies on the other. First one is this, acrylamides. What are acrylamides? Anytime you roast a plant-based thing and it starts to get burnt, it can increase cancer risk. World Health Organization classified acrylamides as a high risk for cancer, possible carcinogen. So that means like if you burn toast, if you burn potatoes, like who doesn't like a little burnt, you know, hash brown or something like that, right? All of those things, high in acrylamides, potentially cancer causing. Now, if your natural killer cells and your T cells are strong and your body's, you know, shields are powerful, will it kill those cancer cells being formed? Yes. But if you're in a weakened state, if you're already inflamed, these can just kind of compound it and, you know, overflow that rain barrel. So just be careful there, right? How do you mitigate this with coffee? You choose instead of doing dark roast, which I know a lot of people love their burnt, you know, <laughs> their burnt dark roast. That's really what it is. It's roasted for longer. Um, you choose a light or medium or just a light medium or just a medium. Kind of a medium is a nice compromise for most people. And then you'll have far less acrylamides. All right. And again, as you go from light to dark, the caffeine goes down and the antioxidants go down. But the flavor typically goes up. That's why people like their dark roast. I typically choose, and the one we make for equal life, which is high antioxidants, good for the liver, um, is light to medium or medium roast. We never go above that. And of course, tested for mold. All right. There are some genetic factors. When we look at genetic testing, we're looking specifically at the CYP1A2 gene, right? So we're looking at specific uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that affect caffeine metabolism. Some people are slow metabolizers, not a benefit for them. Why? When they consume caffeine, what happens? It takes longer to get out of their system. They may be more prone to accelerated heart rate, sympathetic nervous system dominance, fight or flight, cortisol production, norepinephrine production, and anxiety, right? So not ideal. Now, some people are slower metabolizers. These are the people that can typically have a cup of coffee at dinner and still go to bed, no problem, right? Uh, sorry, I meant a fast metabolizer of it. They remove it from their body very, very quickly. All right, slow metabolizer, takes you a long time to get caffeine out of the body, and it really builds up. So you want one cup maximum or someone like myself, half decaf, half regular, one cup a day. I love the taste of it. It's amazing. I have it after breakfast, which blunts that cortisol effect. Uh, and then if I do a cup in the afternoon, it's always decaf. Of course, organic with all coffee, mold-free. And then for decaf, look for Swiss water processed or CO2 extraction. So then there's no harmful uh, ethanol, hexanes, or anything that try to remove the caffeine. All right. The next one is this. Some people, just like with sodium, when they take it in and their body's not balanced, what does it do? It increases high blood pressure. It can increase cholesterol, believe it or not, uh, if you're not using a filter, so like things like espresso uh, or a French press, and it can raise LDL levels, oxidized LDL cholesterol. Now, again, do I get overly concerned about LDL alone? No, but if you have elevated triglycerides, you have total uh, ApoB elevated, you've got VLDL elevated, you've got LDL elevated, yeah, then I look at it. It matters, right? So. For the most part, people should be using a filter typically with the coffee. Again, if you are working with a practitioner, you know exactly all of your genes and how your health is, different story, uh, and that's really the best way to do it. I've got a whole show just on roasting coffee. I'll link that up here today, all the different ways, French press, Chemex, all like literally all the different ways, pour overs, and which one might be best for you. So I'll link that up today at stephencabral.com slash 3414. All right, so we talked about blood pressure. Um, with caffeinated coffee, with some people, it increases blood pressure. Be careful if that's you. You want to switch to decaf. Um, or you just switch over to something 
uh, non-caffeinated or not caffeine related, maybe an herbal tea. All right, so what does all of this mean? Well, we've got big benefits, big benefits potentially for the brain and longevity and overall health. And why are we getting those? Most likely, you know, so if you look at olive oil, you've got this thing called oleic acid, right? Really powerful plant-based compounds. And again, I'm, when I say plant-based, it doesn't mean that you can't eat some meat, fish, and eggs. I'm not saying that at all. But you definitely want to get these plant-based polyphenols and bioflavonoids, these antioxidants in your body. But um, as I just mentioned, there's just massive amounts of antioxidants from coffee. When you look at the most powerful everyday foods that humans eat, not ridiculous foods, right? But everyday foods that we have access to, you're looking at for most, coffee and wild blueberries. Everybody, not everybody, I shouldn't say that. Most people have access to blueberries and coffee. And for the majority of Americans, that's where they're getting their antioxidants, especially from coffee. So it can be really powerful because if you're not drinking it and you're not drinking herbal tea, you're missing out on all the antioxidant-based benefits. Now, what are the risks? Well, the risks are, this is why bioindividualization always matters and you'll never hear me giving blanket statements because there's always nuances. If you are a slow metabolizer of caffeine, be careful. If you're someone with high blood pressure, be careful. If you're someone who's already anxious, be careful with caffeine, right? So that's what we want to look at it. Not the best thing for you. So even though there's longevity benefits, that doesn't mean you have to drink coffee. You can eat wild blueberries. You can eat more of a Mediterranean style diet, get seven to nine servings of fruits and veggies every day. You can get your antioxidants that way. Nobody needs to do just one thing. So hopefully this was helpful for most people. If you're like, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I fall. Shoot for under 300 milligrams of caffeine a day, one or two cups before noon or 1 p.m. for your coffee because it has about a six-hour um, um, half-life. Don't mix it with sugars and all sorts of other um, even artificial-based sweeteners, which would be even worse, like sucralose, Splenda, et cetera, aspartame, sweet and low, none of those. We don't want to uh, mix those in. And what you want to do as well is you can add in some spices. I have another whole podcast on that. I want to link that up for you. StephenCabral.com slash 3414. You'll learn about cardamom, cardamom, cinnamon, and a bunch of others that can be great to add to your coffee as well. So hopefully this was helpful. As always, if the show was helpful, do feel free to share it with anyone you believe it can serve. Have an amazing day, everybody. I'll talk to you tomorrow on the Cabral Content. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.